Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideau, joined as always by the great author and legendary trainer, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing okay. How you doing? Happy birthday. I know it's a day early, but when I don't forget when these people are I try to hide when, from them. When all these great fans are watching this and you know, our great audience is watching tomorrow, it'll be your birthday because today is Monday. We oh, yeah, good point. we tape on Monday and your birthday is on Tuesday. Um yep. when when this will be live. So happy birthday. How old Thank are you? you? I mean sixty six. Okay? No, you're not that old. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, I mean, 52, you 52. 52? Wow. 52 and still still running marathons and still winning marathons. Tremendous, tremendous. And um, though I wanted to, I was a little upset that the Boston Bruins didn't send you the right birthday oh, present. Oh, Teddy, I, I, got I'm, a whole, I'm I got upset a whole, about that. I got a whole rant for you. This is why you can't gamble. I would have bet a hundred thousand that the Bruins would have won this series, and I bet big that they would win the Stanley Cup right before the playoffs started. I, I, this is why I hate being a fan. I hate uh, being emotionally upset about the failures and successes of other men. I'm so pissed off. I'm so disappointed that they got knocked out in the first round. Florida barely made the playoffs. The Bruins had the best record in the history of the NHL. I'm so I'm so disappointed. You would think my kid was on the team. I'm so angry. They're but a good team, though. The Panthers are a good team. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, a hockey expert. For the but Bruins. Yeah, yeah. But see, that's it. It's kind of like boxing. Styles exactly. make fights. If they got the right matchup or a bad matchup for a certain team, it doesn't matter if they didn't finish the season as well. That's um, right. It just highlights that in the NHL, the regular season means next to nothing. You have to get in the playoffs. You have to be hit and stride in playoffs and your goalie has to be hot both our goalies didn't play well you know what's yeah. crazy too the it's kid like who was in the, baseball goalies the, are like pitchers in baseball i mean it's yep. it's so the superstar important. for florida was uh, is uh matthew kachuk you know it's crazy i played hockey growing up with his dad keith kachuk all the way up till high school like same age, same teams, everything. Well, wouldn't that be related to what was a Walter Kachuk from the Rangers? The Rangers way back in the 70s, 80s, Walter Kachuk? I or, do I get it wrong? I don't know. Do, maybe, maybe, I maybe but if he is, I don't know. But his dad, Keith Kachuk, was an NHL all-star, like one of the best in the league when he was at his prime. But you know what's crazy? I was telling someone this the other day about little kids' sports. Me and Keith Kachuk, who was an NHL superstar, we were like of a equal abilities all the way up till high school we got to high school and he just was like see ya i'm going to play now with the guys and i just didn't get better and he just he just like levels to this boxing he just rose to the like he got exponentially better and and i didn't unfortunately but that was the story with a you lot of the kids right. that i played high school with like sean mcgeckrin joe sackle dave sackle like just superstar sean bates played for the bruins just uh, some awesome kids. But to see my friend's kids now being NHL superstars and fighting, and I'm like, woo, I'm getting old, man. This kid, that's my friend's son out there beating people up. He scares me. I, uh, I didn't anyway. know that you played with those that level of uh, guys. When you, oh, yeah. Uh, when I, went, when I was in high school, we lost in the state semifinals at the Boston Garden, two to one, like the like the Bruins. We would kill, we killed everyone. We only lost one game the whole season. And you had and you had future Hall of uh, future uh, NHL players on the team. Not on that team because I went to the public high school and a lot of those kids went oh. to the private schools next door. But we played against all those kids. Keith Kachuk, Sean McGuckin, wow. they all played. And the, and the crazy. Sackles and Bates all played at the same high school, whereas, which is the town I played youth hockey in in Medford, in Medford Massachusetts. But yeah, they were, yeah. I mean, there were kids there that were... And, and those are the kids that had the grades to go to college. There were a couple of kids that I played with. A kid named Brian Casey led the state in scoring, ended up going to jail. It would have been, should have, it should have definitely played in the NHL, was unbelievably good, just couldn't stay out of trouble. And there was a lot of kids like that. It's like same thing with basketball. They talk about like basketball street legends who just for whatever reason didn't make that next step. But you wouldn't know it if you saw them in a summer league with the, NHL, with the NBA superstars. Uh, there's a lot like, of them. Well, when you get to that level, you have to be doing everything right. You have to have the work ethic. You have to have the, the discipline. Of course. And not everyone has all those intangibles. No, of course. The, the character matters. That's know, right. The, the core of what you've been taught is, 
you know, with your parents or what you learn without parents or what, whatever it is that your journey of life was that you have to get to a place where you're stable, you know, in emotional, mental, uh, maturity areas where you can make the right decisions, the right choices, because life is all about choices. You know, you yep. you make one long, just one wrong choice, and your life can make a left turn very fast instead of a right turn. So that's um, right. It's all, and it's always people forget sometimes. I always say this when I'm asked to speak, whether it's to UConn, the men's basketball team that won a national title, or whatever, or high school kids, or to kids about anti-drugs or, you know, anti-suicide, suicidal programs that my foundation runs. Unfortunately, we have to have such programs where we bring psychologists into the schools and we bring mentors into the schools because the reality is there's 12-year-old kids taking their life. I mean, it's, I hate to even say it, but it's, it's out there because of the problems and the things that are going on in their life. And, um, I always say, whether it's to the, like I said, it's to the top level athletes like the UConn men's basketball team, or whether it's to high school kids or elementary kids, I always tell them, listen, the most powerful element in your life, the most powerful asset or quality that you have in your life, it's not your legs, it's not your arms, it's not your, you know, power and your speed and all those kind of neon talents we talk about. It's your ability to make a choice. It's, it's powerful. It's your ability to make a choice, no matter what the circumstances. That's right. And and I always tell them, this is really the the crux of what I what I put out there when I'm asked to go speak to these these groups in these schools or wherever it is. It's always your choice, until you make it not your choice. That no matter what the environment. No matter what's happening, no matter what the chaos that's going on in your world, no matter what the event, the pressure of the event, the enormity of the event, the opponent directly across from you, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's always your choice of how you will act, how you will behave when the moment comes. It's not the event's choice. It's not that person's choice. It's not that team's choice. It's it's not the moment's choice. It's your choice. It's always your choice until you give it up. It is your choice of what you will do. Anyway, that's uh, that's the lesson for the day. That's about <laughs> some. Uh, well, my choice uh, is hockey's over. Let's go Celtics. We're on a hot streak. We're gonna sweep happy Philly. Happy birthday! And- <laughs> happy birthday! <laughs> Can have a great, great, great thank birthday you, thank tomorrow. You. Thank you. I appreciate With your beautiful you. family. And um, yes. what right, are we talking about? Let's what, talk who, fighting. Let's talk who, fighting. Who, let's talk about uh, uh, cannon fodder, one-sided beatdowns, overmatched fights. William Zapata knocks out Jaime Arboleda, Arbolada in the second round with three not three body uh, three different shots to the body that put him down three times all body shots just a one-sided destruction beat down overmatched i mean for a main event jesus this is like a showcase i feel bad Golden boy listen it's going boy it's yeah. it's not just going boy i shouldn't say it that way because it sounds like i'm picking on them it's all these promoters they they build up they they give raw meat to their fighters on the way up build their records and and then fit them in somewhere. But I was you know, thinking about no what different. you would normally say, like, what's the benefit to this kid to well, put him in a, in a main event I, to put him in to run some poor guy over? No one's going. Well, he's twenty seven. Oh is so good. He, he, it's like, dude, that guy is now. way overmatched. I, you know 20, how many crazy. fights does he need to win by the first second round knockout? Twenty seven. Yeah, 20, we said and, before Lomachenko in his second fight was in for a world title against uh, who was it? Uh, Sol- yeah, but, Salida. But in all fairness, Cepeda didn't have the amateur pedigree and background of a Lomachenko. That, who Teddy, that's fair, but you can't be. You don't need to Olympics. beat up guys. He can fight top like guys, Lomachenko, right away. I don't think Cepeda's ready for I, that. I, I agree, but he's I ready agree. for more than this. Uh, look, Twenty-seven fights, and you're still fighting a guy who shouldn't be in there with you. Come on, you wouldn't even let that guy be his sparring partner. Yeah, but that tells you something. 
but something you're not looking at right now. It also gotcha. tells you at 27 and 0, not 14 and 0, not 10 and 0, not 8 and 0, not you know like some of these guys, but not to step up at 27 and 0. Listen to me. It tells you that they know what they have and what they don't have. Yep. It tells right. me that they they don't feel ready to step up yet because they don't feel they have a Lomachenko. And who does? Not too many people who have a Lomachenko. But they don't even feel that they have a Shakur Stevenson or or a, any of that ilk of uh, a fighter or or Tank Davis, obviously, or you know any any of that ilk or uh, a Haney. Since we're talking about light, lightweights, they don't feel because those guys at that time when they get to that place or before that place, they're they're already fighting, you know, substantial enough opponents. They're already fighting somebody consequential, but this guy's still not. So again, that's a red light. That's a red light that that they know he ain't ready. They know that they don't have what they might be promoting they have and saying they have. No matter what they say, it's what they do that matters. And That's what right. they're doing is telling you, no, 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 Cepeda, they don't really think that he's that. And I'll tell you, they're right. Because in only two rounds, you know, he, he knocks the guy out, drops him with left hands. He... In two rounds, he got hit with some clean punches that at that division, he ain't he ain't surviving. In that division with those fighters, in the lightweight division, with the likes of Tank and Loma and Haney and, and Shakur Stevenson might be moving up. Who knows when he'll move up. But, you know, he's a young guy. He's a big guy. He, I'm sure he's probably going to move up at some point. Uh, at that weight class, Zapata, I wouldn't be buying stock. And and <laughs> and, and, and I'm sorry. And I'm, I, I didn't come here mean. to knock him. I came I here to tell the truth, like I do every week. I come here to tell the truth, not to knock anyone. Uh, but if that that becomes part of how it gets addressed, that you're not singing his praises, but you tell him what you know and believe to be the truth that he's not of that ilk, he's not of that stock, well, that's what it is then, if that's how you want to take it. But he's not. For me, he's not. So the thing that frustrated me was the commentator, in the short period that the fight lasted, at one point, I don't know if you heard this, Ken, but at one point that they're, they're singing a little bit of praises of a leader where they're saying he can punch, he's dangerous, he can punch, he can punch. And then all of a sudden, and I don't know, I think it was the second round, they're saying, well, this guy don't have the power to do anything. <laughs> well, you just said he can punch. And he don't have the power. He's not physically strong enough, and he don't have the power to really get Cepeda's attention or his respect or really. And I'm like, but you just finished telling us the one thing he could do. He was dangerous. He could punch. It's like they just say anything. Maybe he's like, saying they could punch just like one of the ushers could get in the ring and throw a punch. Doesn't mean he has power, but I mean, I guess I guess technically, yeah, he could throw a punch, but he ain't hurting him with those punches. Yeah, I mean, he's stupid. implying he can punch with power. But No, I know. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's like some of these guys just say whatever comes to their, in their mouth, and, <laughs> and they just say it because it's convenient to say because, again, uh, I guess they want to try to build something up, but the fans ain't stupid. And not only the fans aren't stupid, but it's, you know, it's going to show. I mean, this guy is going to get knocked out, and then what are you, what are you left with? Like, how are you going to build up a guy who is going to get knocked out in two rounds? And chances are that you should know that that you should recognize that. And you probably do know that. But then you, you can't, it's like they can't help themselves. It's like they can't help but, I hate to say again, you know, put the pom-poms on, uh, do a little howling for their meals, you know. But they can't, it's like the, it's like the truth gets in the way of, I don't know if they even recognize the truth anymore. I think it's just what's convenient. What's convenient, what they think they can 
what what comes to their mouth, like I said before, uh, quickly, and and they just say it, and then afterwards they just reverse it instead of saying I'm sorry, I was wrong. Oh, oops, you know they just say Oh, he don't have power. Like they just, it's like they just erase it like a eraser board, but they forget that. It's out there that you heard it. Yeah, but what's the accountability? Even if you heard it, it, like the only point of reference they have for telling the truth was probably you. And look at what happened. People don't want to hear the truth. The producer and the show promoter, they want to hear the narrative. They don't care about your opinion or but the, the truth. But the truth matters. The I, truth I know. Matters. I'm with and you. And I'm not being a Boy Scout over here, but I'm just saying the truth matters because it's going to come out. It's going to, you know, that old saying, uh, the cream rises to the top. It, it's it's going to come forward. The truth is going to come forward. And then what are you left with? You're left with no credibility, you, you know, and, and then you got to all of a sudden reverse fields. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's just absurdity uh, to me when when you see some of this and you hear some of this that, you know, it's so obvious, but... Um. Anyway, they another thing that uh, I was I had a little problem with was the production. The they they're showing the replays. They drops them three times in the second round. Cepeda drops Abolita three times, and the first one you see the body shot. You see it. The next two you don't see it. I I still looking for it. I mean, I, I I guess it landed because the guy is writhing in pain on the floor, right? But you never saw a view of it. You never saw a clean view of it. They never, maybe they didn't have it, but they should have it. They should have an angle that can give you that view of the punch landing cleanly instead of it being, you know, very abstract at best, where, where really you just have to say, okay, I guess it landed because obviously a uh, half a second later he fell down, <laughs> you know, and he's crawling on the floor. So I guess it landed, and, and I'm sure it did. But just poor, just poor production in that way. Um, but again, uh, I just, if they're selling stock in Cepeda, uh, I'm not in right now. I'm I'm <laughs> the, short. I'm not in. Yeah, I'm short, and especially at that weight class. Especially yeah. at that weight class. Nah, I'm with you. Before we jump over and talk about the main event at the UFC, just a couple of um, news. Just well, news from last week was uh, Tiafimo Lopez was ripping um, the announcers in ESPN, saying that they only fight, they only promote the black fighters, and he's not happy. He's only got one fight left on his deal. Uh, Tiafimo to me seems to be on a path of self destruction. I think ever since that. Um, the, the the loss to um, Cambosis, he seems to be just coming undone. You remember in the ring after the fight, he was asking the, his dad or the trainer, like, I, do I have it anymore? I don't know. Do I have it? I, he could, didn't, couldn't seem to get off on time, seemed like he was losing a step. And it's like you and I have talked about before with a guy like a Roy Jones or someone who's just so quick and so athletic that the minute they lose one fraction of a second on those fast twitch muscles, it's like the, sh the stuff that was working doesn't work anymore. And he's questioning his whole sp spot in the, in the sport and it seems that way from his actions and his the way he's behaving outside of the ring the way he's acting in the ring it just seems like something is something's off with him right i mean i, I get having a problem with the network and the promoter but to speak out so publicly and be so aggressive with those accusations is um reckless to say the least but just curious if you saw it if you had any thoughts no i didn't see it my only thoughts is off of what you're bouncing off of what you're saying um, that, look, we know that there's been a precarious relationship, a good one, I should, maybe I shouldn't say precarious, but at least a precarious relationship with his father, who's his trainer, and the public, or, or uh, people that are involved in Teofimo's career and trying to better his career, that they, not everyone has felt that the father's the right person for him, put it that way. For Although sure, he did yeah. a good job getting him there. So yep. you, can't, you can't kind of erase that. He did a good job getting him there. But, um, and I'm sure part of it is you've got 200 fights, you learn how to fight. 
you know yeah. that's part and you have talent and he had talent and he had confidence and but the father was still part of that obviously that success and that progress getting him there but then since that it, it's it has looked to the outsiders at least to us like the father has been in some cases a distraction um not always giving him the best advice in a corner um not always seeming to understand the truth versus you know what he perceives as the truth of what just happened or what's happening because he's so in love with his son okay but you got to separate that stuff you could be in love with your son but if you're going to be a professional corner man and trainer then you have to you have to toe a line and you have to separate the emotional part from the professional part so you can help your son yeah. to the highest level. Be able to see what emotions don't let you see. You know, see things that an outsider might see that's not as emotionally attached. So it just seems like, I think I'm being very fair about this breakdown, that he, that there's been problems in that area, uh, you know, ever since he beat Lomachenko. And yeah. it's been a little bit of a downward spiral since. Obviously, he lost his title to Cambosis and and then he he's never gotten back to that level that we all thought he was at. And quite frankly, we thought that he would even advance from and, and maybe have a dominant career. Uh, it, it has, at the very best, it has stalled a little bit or puttered a little bit, a little bit. And, and let's not forget, he left top rank he did leave top rank, and then he went to Trillo, whatever the name of that. Oh, that's right, yeah. And and he was going to have to fight for whatever kind of money over there, and then he had to actually, the the fight never, the money wasn't there. I think Trillo lost the purse, I think ESPN lost the purse bid, so Trillo yeah, was well, able whatever. to promote his fight, and, and, yeah. yeah. But he had, the one, money he had one, one fight without top rank and, and came yeah, right and back. Yeah, the money wasn't there, and then he had to go back to top rank you know, a little bit with his tail between his legs or at least the father a little bit, um, you know, after basically telling them that, you know, it's a new it's a new world, it's a new time, it's our time, basically kind of like suggesting to top rank and everybody out there in the boxing world that the king has arrived and, you know, you're going to have to pony up and it's a whole different time. And, you know, kind of like, uh, well, the takeover, that was his name, right? The That's takeover. Right. That wasn't a mistake. You know, the takeover, we're taking over, we're yeah. going to a new place and, and, you know, you better be ready for it. And it didn't quite, it didn't quite happen quite nope. that way. So I, I think there's a lot of stuff going on. I always talk about the mental side the confidence, the, the the mental side of how you feel about yourself. And if that side's not right, the physical side don't mean a damn thing. It don't oh, mean a right. thing. It's like, it's like having a Ferrari car that you drive, right? You've got red ones, white ones, uh, yellow ones. I don't know which one you're black. driving this week. Black. black. All right, beautiful. I like black. So you have a Ferrari. I mean, forget about it, right? I mean, the horsepower, the, the engineering, everything. But... If the driver's worth, um, <laughs> if the driver's me, you ain't winning. If the any driver races. ain't that good. Put it that way. <laughs> if the driver, driver ain't worth his salt, uh, you know what? You're just gonna run into a tree a lot faster, <laughs> you know, than you would with a slower car or with a lesser car. That that's all that's gonna happen. And right now, the driver of this car, he's still got a good car. The, physically, there's nothing wrong with the guy. But the driver right now is is not not up to the job of handling this handling this car. And uh, you know Speaking of uh father and son, I also announced today um Ryan Garcia moving on from Joe Goosen. And, and I saw one of the co someone commented one of the boxing uh Twitter guys posted it. Yeah, okay, Ryan Garcia, if he showed up to train with my gym, I'd tell him, like, you can come in. Your dad can't be involved. This is just a trainer-fighter relationship. There's no parents involved in at this stage. And I don't think that Ryan's dad has been involved in the boxing as much as Tiafimo, at least not as no, vocal. No, not nearly as but, much. No. But as vocal. But that was just but an interesting uh, interesting turn of events. And I saw but a I, I agree. But I agree with that. 
I knew you would, but let me fin- Let me just say one other well, thing. Well, no, Goosey- I'm just saying, can I agree? Because let the pros do their job. Like, in other words, yeah. you know, like if you go and hire somebody, let them do the job. If you hire, like, if, if you hire a lawyer to defend you in a case, you know, you're not, you know, you, you can't go into that, you can't bring your father into the lawyer's office <laughs> as he's preparing your case. You can, he'll just throw you out. And be looking over his shoulder to see how you're preparing it because it's not, you know, it's not permissible. It it doesn't make sense. Well, the other thing that I wanted to tell you is- But in boxing, they get away with it, though. The other thing I wanted to tell you as part of that is that after the fight, Goosen said in an interview, no one really trains Ryan Garcia. It's a collaboration. He knows so much about the sport that you're just essentially collaborating with the fighter. So- I, I mean, oh. I guess in in essence, you could make that argument for. Well, for then any you're not a trainer, has, whatever. Then you're not a trainer. Yeah. I don't know what you are. You're yeah. a collaborator. I don't know what that means. I I mean, I I don't know. I I've I don't know. I all I know is I've I train a fighter. I train a fighter, and and it's my responsibility, good or bad. You know, it, it's uh, I'm uh, if I'm not in charge of training them, then I'm not training them because I have a responsibility to get them better, to improve them, whatever it is, to get them ready, of course, for a specific fight, but mostly to improve them and make sure that I understand all the areas that he needs to improve in and that he can get better in, um, you know, and, and that's your responsibility. Um, at the end of the day, if somebody says, well, and they have people have called me a dictator well teddy you're a dictator he's a dictator he wants to be in charge i don't deny it i mean it's like they're saying something that i'm gonna go nuts and say oh my god you call me a dictator i'm gonna say yeah if that's how you want to address it if that's how you want to phrase it if that means being in charge being a trainer being responsible being culpable you know taking the responsibility win or lose that that the preparation of this fighter falls on your shoulders, um, and that means that you're doing it your way. Yeah, then I'm a dictator. They they come to you for a reason. They don't come to you, you know, in my world to collaborate. They come to you to take charge. To, to right. and otherwise go somewhere else. No problem. But yep, I mean that's the whole idea, and and really. It's, it's, it's just the responsibility of what goes in to being a trainer that you are in charge. That yeah, same you, thing with like a football team. No one's gonna tell Belichick what what he can and can't do. He what are you gonna collaborate and- with Bill Belichick? I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, you Bill Belichick's gonna say, you know, I just show up and um and. Tom Brady runs the show, and I'm just a collab. No, no, Tom Brady does his job, and you, as the head coach, make sure that he's doing his job. That's and Tom exactly Brady is right. great, but but you're still the head coach. You make sure he's doing his job, and if he's not, you steer him in the right direction. But and and you make the you point out the adjustments that have to be pointed out, or whatever they are, the changes that have to be pointed out. I, I never understood that, you know. Uh, I, I never understood that uh, when uh, uh, either you're either you're in charge or or go get a ticket and be a fan. But if you're <laughs> the trainer, if you're the and and I agree, you can't have a father, you know, looking over your shoulder and like if you like I go back to the analogy of the lawyer. You hire a lawyer, your life's on the line. Guess what? In boxing, your life's on the line in even more serious ways. But your life might be on the line with a lawyer. And you hire that lawyer. You're going to have your father or whoever in his law office looking over his shoulder. I'll tell you one thing. If the lawyer permits that, I'm firing him the next day. <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, he ain't my we lawyer. Could, he, I don't want we, him as my lawyer. If he's going to talk because about he's this. Compromi- because of he's course. compromising himself. Of course, we could do a whole episode on the father-son dynamic. But... We've Listen, at good... the end of the day, I want to say this. Go ahead. I think Teofimo's a decent kid. I think he's a decent kid. I talked to him once, once or twice. I think once. I ran into him in Vegas. When he's away from all of this, and you're just one-on-one with the core of the human being, 
I saw a good core. I saw just a decent enough human being. I don't pretend to know him beyond, you know, anything that I'm saying right here. But I just thought that he's a this this is not a a wacko kid. This is not just a but that doesn't mean that he's it doesn't mean that he's not influenced by people around him. And listen, at the end of the day, you're a full-grown man. Like I said earlier, the most powerful thing you have in life is to make a choice. Make your choice of how you That's behave, right. what you do. It's it's his choice. It's no yeah. one else. He's a full-grown man. But you, you are influenced by things around you and people around you, and you're impacted by those things. And the realm of boxing is is like no others other than UFC, other you know, uh, MMA or, or war, which is even worse. But the realm, it's such a perilous realm. It's such a scary realm. It's such a emotional realm. It's such a fearful realm. It's such a pressurized realm that people don't realize that. They think that it's just about, okay, you you can punch like hell, you got fast hands, you've been taught good technique, you got quick feet, get in the freaking place and blow the guy out and do your thing. But when you're in that realm, when you're in that battlefield, it's just like knowing how to shoot a gun. But then you get on the battlefield, the battlefield of war. And with everything that's part of that battlefield, the reality of that somebody could kill you, that there's enemy all around you, that there's a fearful atmosphere there for a reason. When you get out, suddenly your aim's not as good. Suddenly the squeeze on the trigger isn't as steady. That is, it's, that's what people don't quite get about boxing, that, that if they're not right mentally in that realm, it doesn't matter, I'm saying it again, how good, how many cylinders the car has. It doesn't matter how many quick twitch fibers you have in your body genetically. None of that matters. If you're not right mentally, if you're not calm with yourself, at peace with yourself, uh, together with yourself, in that unnatural realm, yeah, I said it, unnatural realm, in that, in that uncomfortable realm, if you're not, if you, then, then you're, then you have problems. And right now, there's very few people that are going to touch on what I just said. Same thing with Ryan Garcia, what he's going through. Right now, it ain't just physical. Yeah, technically, he could be improved in certain areas, Teofimo. There's no doubt about it. He, 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 has, he has diminished a little bit technically. But aside from that, it's, it's not the mental part. I mean, it's not the physical part, it's the mental part. Right now, he he is not comfortable in that realm. He can't be comfortable in that realm because there's too many things that are happening in his life. We're not aware of all of them. We know that he's had personal things where he got married and he, I believe he's not married anymore in a very short period of time. The father didn't... Um, it's, from what we know publicly, the father didn't uh, didn't like the wife, or didn't agree with him getting married with the with the girl that he got married to. Uh, he had a problem with that. Whatever. All we know is at the end of the day, the marriage didn't last, and all of those things they trickle down to affect you, and 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 just subtract from you in 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 certain areas. And you can't be subtracted from in any of those areas when you, for a living, are going into an unnatural realm, an uncomfortable realm, a fearful realm. You have to be right in those areas. And right now, he's not, I think it's pretty apparent, he's just not right right now in, in that realm. And, and listen, as far as him... Uh, calling out the ESPN commentators and all that stuff. I, you know, I, I don't know anything about that. All I, I, I don't put credence into that. But I just think that this kid, who's not a bad kid, I think he's mixed up right now. I think there's a I lot agree. of stuff going on in this kid's world right now yep. that I hope get addressed. 
Yeah, I'm with you. I hope he does. And um, before we jump over and talk about the main event over on the UFC this past weekend, uh, let me give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, Athletic Greens. Check them out at athleticgreens.com slash atlas. And if you with your first order, you'll get 10 of these free travel packs which are invaluable. I take them with me everywhere I go. Athletic Greens is a simple all-in-one green drink. You mix a scoop of Athletic Greens in the morning with 10 to 12 ounces of water, shake it up, boom. It's an all-in-one multivitamin, basically an insurance policy for your immune system. Cheaper than a cup of coffee. Some people have said to me, oh, it's a little pricey. Well, it's less than a cup of coffee and it actually has a ton of benefits. It's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients. So it's like all the good parts of real fruits and vegetables all mixed into one. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas. Get the 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Teddy, Song Yadong puts it on Ricky Simone. Pure stand-up fight for the most part. Song eventually figures him out every single time. Uh, Simone would throw a jab. Uh, so, so Don, uh, Song Yedong would come over with a, with a straight left. I think he was a left, right? Southpaw? Um, straight shot every time. It finally puts him away. Um, I thought it was a good stoppage. Song was put, beating the brakes off him on the ground. Unfortunate stop, uh, loss for Ricky Song, Simone. Song's not Song a southpaw. The only reason I know that for sure is because he scored those brilliant Knockdowns yeah, and knockdowns with the left hook from an orthodox position. Yeah, yeah, he position. was hitting him. Before he stopped him, before he hit him with the big left hook, he was hitting him with straight rights. Every time Simone threw a jab, Song would shoot a right hand right over and crack him and eventually wore him down, figured him out over the first four, and then put him away in the first minute of the fifth round. How'd you like the fight? I was, I was impressed. Very close, very close round. Simone was trying to get, you know, it's always about the geography of the ring. I always talk about that, and it's always consistently true, where you have to get to the area that best suits your skills. And it was very clear that Simone was trying to get the takedown so he could get where he had the advantage on the mat. And, of course, Song wanted to stay on his feet where he had the advantage striking, and he could use his, you know, those the elements that he had striking, the, the assets that he has striking. And... So it was a very close round. Simone was trying to get the takedown, but he couldn't get it. And um, he obviously wanted to get there and, and show his grappling skill. And I thought at the end of the round, it was a non-eventful round, but it was a slight edge to Song after the first round. And then the second round, a very good round for Song, landing some heavy shots, and it was very clear that he's a big puncher. And the thing that really impressed me about him, why he gets such power in his punches, or one of the reasons, he's always set on his feet. He's always balanced. And the great commentators pointed that out. DC and who was the other one? DC was with um, Cruz. Um, yeah. Cruz Dominic, and, um, Dominic, Dominic Cruz, Cruz huh? yeah, and I yeah, think Fitz, they, they, uh, Fitzgerald. Yeah, they were great. Fitzgerald. They're always great. All those guys. Brandon Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. They're 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 truly experts, which you supposed to have there. And anyway, um, he's always set song, balanced in position, never out of position with his feet. Reminds me a lot of in a way, the great fighter from Japan who's a world champion. Uh, and still undefeated, one of the top, in my top five, uh, as far as pound-for-pound pound fighters in boxing. He reminds me of him because he's always balanced. He's always in position, and he's a good puncher. So uh, the second round, it was it was Song's round um, with... Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to remember, look at my nose... It was, there was a takedown scored just, I guess, at the end of the second round by Simone. But it still was Song's round. I felt that he was still up two to nothing. And then the third round, close, but I gave it again to Song because he was, again, the geography. He was controlling the geography, doing what he wanted, standing and striking, 
even though Simone did score a takedown. Song, one of the things that makes Song so dangerous is that even though that's not his forte, being on the f- floor, he's very good at defending the takedowns, Ken. And you have to be that if you're going to be in this world, in this business, in the UFC, and you're going to try to dominate as a striker. You have to at least defend the takedowns. And he does a good job of doing that. He did a very good job, and I was impressed with that. Um, so he could do what he wanted to do, which is obviously stand and strike. Fourth round, Song drops Simone at the end of the round with, as we just talked about, that's why I know he's he, he's not a southpaw. He dropped him with a beautiful short counter left hook. And he set it up beautifully with a trap step. You know, a little trap step back, drawing, drawing Simone in, and then with that space there, countering with the left hook. Beautiful, really beautiful. Fifth round, he stops him with another beautiful left hook. And then, of course, he showed he knows how to finish. You always want to see that. It's the guy a finisher, you know. Uh, and certain guys, you know, great fighters, but they're not finishers. He is a finisher, uh, Song. He jumped on Simone. He would not let up. And there was three ways that I was Im- just very impressed in three ways. And I made a note. One, Getting and keeping the geography, I already said that, that he wanted. Striking all night and showing a good takedown prevent defense. Number two, obviously something that, as I always talk about, you're born with, you're not taught. It's born, it's not taught. And that's power, pure power. Uh, But what is taught is the technique of keeping his legs balanced and in position. So striking power good technique, always being balanced and in position with his legs. And number three, and this is the maybe the most important one, and something, again, that it's either there or it's not there, the ability to deliver his punches with great timing and instincts. Just great instincts and timing. He delivered those punches at the right time. And, and the ability to stay calm in an uncalm environment is part of that. He's a dangerous guy, and he's fun and exciting to watch. Yep, that pretty much sums it all up. Um, Curious to see what's next for Song. But with that, let's talk about a preview of uh, upcoming boxing and um, UFC fight next weekend. Let's start with the boxing. Canelo, to me, the face of boxing, back in action against John Ryder. I think it's I think it's in Mexico. And uh, I've got the lines here for you. I thought it might be 10,000 to 1, but it's uh, Canelo. We got Canelo minus 2,000, John Ryder plus plus 665 from the guys at my bookie. Check them out at mybookie.ag. Use the promo code ATLAS for a 50% depo- credit on your first deposit. So that you de- up to $1,000. You deposit two grand, they'll give you another thousand to bet with. Mybookie.ag, use the promo code ATLAS. This, this segment of the show is sponsored by them. Uh, Teddy, what are we looking for out of Canelo? And is there anything John Ryder can do to win this fight? Well, John Ryder... 34 years old, 32 and 5. He's been knocked out one time and um, stopped one time. (laughs) His best win, best name on his record is he beat an old Danny Jacobs. Old Danny Jacobs. Split decision. Um, So at least that helps him, helps Ryder in his mind that he belongs here at this level. And that's very important. He's got experience. And that's very important. He lost to Callum Smith, lost to Rocky Fielding, in a split decision. He lost to Jack Onfield, and he was stopped by Nick Blackwell, and he lost to Billy Joe Saunders. So he lost to four guys that Canelo beat. But here's the key, Ken. I think Canelo's getting old. I think he's Mm -hmm. sliding. He didn't look good against a very old Triple G. Did not look good for me. That, you know, I'm not the pom-pom guy, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to tell you the the way it is, like how it goes sell. You know, telling you the way it is, you know, um, like it is. 
what was Cosell's, uh, what was his signature thing? Um, telling you like it is, I think. T- was it telling it like it is, or was it um, telling it like it is? I guess that sounds good enough, but <laughs> you're not getting this pom pom stuff over here. Obviously, people know that by now. Canelo is not the greatest Mexican fighter of all time. He's not even in the top 10. And again, calm down. I have great, great admiration and respect for the history of that country with their fighters. The great, great warriors and fighters that have come from that country. And that's why I say he's not in the top 10. Because I have great respect for those, the tradition of boxing in Mexico. Great respect. Where I'm not going to let somebody be placed in there that don't belong in there. Uh, where people don't even know who the great fighters are that argue with me. Oh, Teddy, you don't like Canelo. I like Canelo. I like that he's never gotten in trouble. He's a real good, solid fighter. I like that he's improved over the years uh, to, uh, for, uh, to the extent that he continued to get better. But I face the truth. I face the truth that he's not. You, you Mexico has such great, great, fighters in their history he's not one of the top ones not 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 at that level but more importantly now more relative right now is that he's sliding a little bit i think he's getting old you know he turned pro when he was 15 or 16 right he's he's got what has he got over 60 fights now canelo and you know he's he's only 32 You'd think that he'd be 82 as long as he's been around, right? I mean, because he turned pro, what, 15 or 16 in Mexico. So he's been around an awful long time, but I just see a little sliding. And now I don't know that it's enough for John Ryder to have a chance, but I'll tell you one thing about John Ryder. He's a southpaw. That Maybe that gives him a little something, that he is a southpaw. And he's... He's only an inch taller than Canelo, so he's a stocky, physical guy. He likes to be aggressive, but he's he's not really reckless. He comes in slow, takes his time, tries to be methodical, moves his head, but he's not fast. He don't have quick hands. He don't have quick feet. He is predictable. He is a bit one-dimensional, and with the edge of the southpaw that could give him a little help, being that he's a southpaw, but where it falls a little short is that he's a he's a squared up southpaw. He's not a cutie. He's not a southpaw that behaves like a southpaw that can give you the kind of problems that lefties can give you. He's he's right there in front of you, where it almost don't matter that he's a southpaw because you know he's coming at you in the way that you can expect, right? in front of you where there's 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 something to find you don't have to go look for him so but he's a game guy he's a guy that is he he, he's at a probably the best place he's been in his career uh you know as far as mentally confidence he's a guy that will give us all he's a guy who's hungry all of those things but he's also just what the doctor ordered for Canelo to get better coming off that bad performance against Triple G where he hasn't really been, lo- and the loss to Bevel, where he wants to kind of get back up in people's minds as Canelo, you know, that people thought. Not that that was, perception of him was accurate, but it, it was the perception. He's the best. A lot of people had him the number one pound for pound guy and in boxing. And he wants to get back to that status or close to that status. This would be probably one of the guys to do it with. Unless Canelo has gotten old. Then it changes everything. Then it changes everything. But Canelo, if he's not significantly diminished as I'm starting to see some sliding, then he should look good against Felder. For the reason I, I mean Ryder, for the reason I just said, Ryder's going to come at him. 
He's not fast. He's predictable. He's right in front of him. Uh, I think Canelo can use his jab to control him. I think he could go to the body. I think he could do some counter punching. He might even be able to use the uppercut, which is a really good punch for Canelo. He didn't really use it in, if, in his last couple fights. But it's a fight where, it's a punch where if a guy's in front of him where he can find the guy, it's a very productive punch for him. Um, I think he could do all those things with Ryder, theoretically. If, as I said, Canelo, you know, hasn't regressed um, any more from what I thought I saw was a regression in his last fight with Triple G. Um, you know, uh, Canelo is 58, what is he, is he 58? Two and two, I think. So he's got, he's got uh, 62 fights, I guess. He's 58, two and two. He's 32 years old. And I just want to break down when people say the tangible stuff behind what I'm saying, not just my opinion, but the the factual, concrete, documented stuff by, that f helps form my opinion. Canelo, he, he had a draw to a three and five fight early in his career. Okay, that could happen. But... He lost every round to Mayweather. He really lost or should have lost to Triple G twice. He got a draw and a win in the first two fights. He really, I thought he lost both fights. Most people would concur with that, at least with the first one, I, uh, I believe. Um, he lost 11 of 12 rounds to Bevo, no matter what the psychotic judges, crooked judges were trying to tell you. He should have lost maybe to Lara earlier in his career. And, you know, again, to call him the greatest Mexican fighter, or some people call him that, I think it's, I just think it's wrong. And I brought a list of my greatest Mexican fighters because, again, I'm not just going to talk. I'm going to back it up. I'm going to back up my list of greatest Mexican fighters. or give it to you. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., lightweight, Junior welterweight champion, junior lightweight champion, Ruben Olivares, maybe the most exciting Mexican fight of all time, uh, Bantam and Featherweight. See, the problem is a lot of these people that, I'm, that are going to get mad at me not calling him the greatest, they don't even know these guys. That's the sin of it all. That's like guys that in baseball don't even know who like Jackie Robinson is or, you know, know who some of the... And, and they're saying only these other guys... Because they're the ones that they grew up with. They're the ones they heard. They're the ones that the the names that are, you know, fed to them. But if you want to really be able to accurately make a case for your guy, whoever it is, do a little work and look at the history that you're talking about, whether it's baseball, boxing, whatever it happens to be, look at that history and see who you're comparing him to. Instead of just saying, oh, yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, Salvador Sanchez, he's my favorite. He's my number one, but I, I made this list. You could adjust it a little bit. Salvador Sanchez died way too young. Great, great fighter. Baby Arizmendi, he beat Henry Armstrong three of six fights. Henry Armstrong, for people out there, most people know, he, he's probably my favorite fighter of all time. He had 255, whatever he had, 200 some fights, about 110 knockouts. He won three full titles, featherweight, no in-between titles, featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight, and defended them simultaneously and should have won the middleweight against Severino Garcia, but they robbed him. They made it a 15-round draw. Henry Armstrong's just a, a beast. And um, to beat Henry Armstrong... Three of Henry Armstrong once I think fought thirty five times in a year. I mean, like I said, he had over two hundred fights. This to beat Henry Armstrong. Can you imagine what kind of fighter you had to be? So, baby, I was Mendy. I guarantee you, these guys that are saying, "Daddy, you don't like Canelo. You, you're full of crap. You, 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 you,
they don't know who this guy is. Go find out who they are. Go and, and research these guys before you say silly stuff. And I have to send you off, you know, to your corner and say, come back out when, when you've done a little work and a little studying. Then come back and talk to me. Carlos Serrate, bantamweight champion. Uh, Vincent Sadafar, featherweight champ. Manuel Ortiz, bantamweight champ. Ricardo Lopez, junior flyweight champ. Raton Macias, bantamweight champ. Baby Casanova. And then I didn't even get into the more recent fighters that I think are above him. Juan Marquez, Eric Morales, Antonio Barrera. Those are great fighters. Great fighters. Great, great, great fighters that have fought the best fighters that were available. Everybody. If they were super middleweight, they would have... If they were super middleweight right now, like Canelo, right? If they were the guys around, they would they would have fought. They would have fought um, ben, uh, uh, Benavides. They would have fought Benavides. They would have fought him. He'd be on their record. They would have wanted to fight him. They wouldn't navigate around fighting John Ryder and these, these other guys. And I'm not knocking John Ryder. He's a solid enough fighter. He's a, he, he's a tough kid. He deserves a payday. I, I'm happy he's getting a payday. He's earned the right to get a payday. You know, he's fought a lot of good fighters. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just saying Canelo's the greatest ever and he, all that. Well, then, <laughs> and he's the greatest junior middleweight right now. He wants to be, all right, fine. Then fight those guys. Fight Benavides. Fight the top guys. But I think so many navigate. guys today have seen what Floyd did with his career, and they're trying to emulate exactly that. They're trying to squeeze every ounce of value out of the career, which financially might make sense, but it doesn't win you a popularity contest with the hardcore fans. Look, Canelo clearly has his share of fans, but and and you could argue he's the face of boxing. But look, at the end of the day, when you compare the numbers that those guys make, and Canelo makes as much as anyone, they don't even scratch the surface of what the heavyweights make. I mean, when they're talking $100 million uh, for Anthony Joshua fighting in Saudi Arabia, that kind, those kind of numbers, like, it's just heavyweights are where the action is it, it, always. I mean, Andy Ruiz, $5 million to show up and fight AJ last minute at, at Madison Square Garden. It's just the numbers are are on the next level. Uh, before we talk about anything else, Teddy, the over under on the uh, Canelo Ryder fight, eight and a half rounds, even money, one minus one seventeen either way. Over under eight and a half rounds. What do you think? I'm going over. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that he could get him out of there. He could get Ryder out of there. And I said Ryder's made to order. Potentially made to order. With the doctor order to make Canelo feel better if Canelo has to step back. I think he stepped back a little bit. And I, I think Ryder right has enough experience, enough grit to at least go some rounds with him. Uh, I don't think he can win the fight. And, I don't, and I'm not saying that he'll get through the whole night without being stopped. I think he, but he has been stopped already once in his career. Um, that could easily become two. But I'm going to say that it would go over. Uh, you know, in the, in the last fight that Canelo had um, against Triple G, for me, he looked slow. He often threw just single shots. He did not follow up on any opportunities. He was always satisfied to just barely do enough to have an edge. And he did not move his hands nearly enough throughout the night. You know, so and and but as I said before, if he has anything left, Ryder should be what the doctor ordered. But How much of that Canelo performance do you put on? Maybe every time he was moving his hands more or trying to be more aggressive, Triple G was countering him, and he was in there with someone who arguably beat him twice already. Maybe he was tentative, it, coming off of um, 
Good question. You know, the last, the last two outings, you know, it's, it's like sometimes you hear Good that question. trainer telling, I, throw the jab, throw the jab. Every time I throw a jab, he hits me right over the no, top. Well, Give me some different thing. advice. So I'm just he wondering, and, 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 if he, and if Canelo doesn't say, I got to come out and look good against Ryder because everyone's saying exactly what you're saying. He should get him. Well, he I, should beat him. I, I think part of it to your question, good question. Part of it is, first of all, Triple G made some adjustments. He he did a good job of stepping out of range to make Canelo miss. Pretty pretty good job of stepping out of range. That's the problem. Canelo didn't follow up. That that was missing, and I noticed that was missing. Um, also, Triple G, like he did in his second fight with him, which he got robbed, I thought, uh, he did a good job using his jab, even at 42 years of age. I think he was 42. Having said all of that, there's always intangibles. There's always X factors. And I think the X factor, I'm making no excuses, obviously, for Canelo. It's your responsibility to get in there and be ready, mentally, physically, emotionally, every way. I think he might have overlooked Triple G a little bit. I think that, you know, he knew what everyone else was talking about, that the fight was five years too late, that, that Triple G or whatever, that Triple G was older, that Triple G was getting hit a lot in his fight before that with the with the Murata, the Japanese fighter, who he, he overcame it, but he was getting hit a lot. And he you know, and I think he was probably expecting an easier fight, which you should never expect, you know, in, in any profession. Your profession is to be ready, whatever your profession is, whatever that vocation is that you should never expect it to be an easy day. You should always expect whatever it is you do for a living to be ready for the utmost, to be ready for the hardest day you ever had, to be ready for that. So uh, I think that was part of it. Um, will he look brilliantly better? I don't know. I think that's the only reason you're going to watch this fight if you're a Canelo fan and you want to... You know, you want to see, will he look better than he did? Or is it a, is this downward trend? Lost to Bevo, didn't look good against Triple G. Is this downward trend real? Is it real? Does it continue? I think that's why you look to watch this fight. Yep, I couldn't agree more. Um Next topic, UFC fight coming up this Saturday. Uh, you'll be working for ESPN. Rob and I will be there in attendance. Looking forward to meeting some of the fans for the big Henry Cejudo versus Aljamain Sterling main event, UFC in Newark. I'm, I'm going to so talk to Charlie this. Monahan. I'm, I'm a... Uh, whatever. But I'm going to talk to him, <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see. if Maybe we could set up a little something. I know it's different. They don't have a supposedly they don't have a studio set up, whatever. ESPN has me there covering the fight. It's a great, great show. Great show. Um, at the Prudential Center, as you said. I'm going to see, maybe there's a way we can get together and, and say hello to the fans at some point before the festivities start. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But in the, in the meantime, I'm so glad you guys are going to be there. You're going to be there with me. Um, you you went out there. You bought your own tickets. I appreciate you. You you you're flying in, and um, like I said, I'm 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 thrilled you're gonna be there. It should be a great show. And then you're gonna stay over the weekend because then Monday we're gonna go to the Trinity Boxing Club, uh, with with Martin Snow. Uh, that you know he's the proprietor there. He's great. We're gonna go there in Manhattan. And we're going to do another fight plan. We're going to do Lomachenko and Haney. Yep. And we'll record a live uh, episode in person together for the first time in yeah, a long time. Yeah, we'll do a live episode in person right there at the gym uh, after we do the fight plan. And I'm um, no doubt Irish John Duddy will be down there looking as sharp as ever. He like should he could be. still get in I the hope ring he and is. crack someone. And, and I hope he is in Kid Chocolate. Um, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Quillen. Yeah, Peter Quillen. And, you know, just. There's good people down there. So I always look forward to going there. I look forward to seeing you guys. I look forward to this show. I I look forward to both the co-main and the main. The main, of course, Henry Secudo against Sterling. 
listen, here's a quick breakdown from my perspective. It's pretty simple, and it's probably similar to most. First of all, can Sadudu come back after three years off? You know, he was a former champion, just great, and 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 a a different level grappler, wrestler, you know, Olympic gold medalist, just a different level, different level. Uh, By the way, before you give the breakdown, let me give you the line so you can work your yeah. uh, prediction in. I got um, Aljamain minus 115 as a slight favorite. Henry Cejudo minus 105 for the guys at my bookie. Check them out at mybookie.ag. Use the promo code ATLAS. Say the line again, Ken. I, I want to hear it again. Minus 115 on Aljo. Minus yeah, 105 close. on Cejudo. So they're showing great respect to Cejudo. Cejudo. Uh, Cejudo, they show yep. great respect to to Cejudo because of what he's been. You know, even if he's been off three years. Look, here's what it is for me. It's a it's it's a tremendous anticipated fight. I, I, I'm riveted because Sterling is a little younger. And he's very strong. He's the champion. He's very confident right now. And he's very strong, very physically strong. He's well-rounded. Cejudo wants to get to the mat. It'll be very interesting because Sterling's strong there too if they get there because I said it before purposely. I selected my words. Cejudo's a different level. Or he has been before he took off three years. Is he still that different level of a grappler, of a wrestler? It's going to be very, very, very interesting. And um, I, I think it's intriguing. I really do. And then you get to the co, and you got an equally intriguing match. You got, you got Burns and you got Muhammad, Belay Muhammad. Now I think you got a things, couple things that I would point out for me to break this fight down and to you know project this fight. First of all, Muhammad uh, Burns is f- coming back very fast. He just fought. Four I don't weeks. know if that's gonna uh, incredible. I don't incredible. know if that's gonna help him or hurt him. I, I I would lean towards it might hurt him, but I don't know. I don't know. Because I don't know if he had enough time to properly recover, rest his body in between these fights. I don't know. That's a but, very good point. And you could make an argument for either way. Because as uh, in running, I've had it help me and hurt me where it's too yes. much too soon. And other times where I'm like, oh, my God, I have cr- tremendous fitness from that last camp. And then getting some rest afterwards. And then uh, last minute you jump into another race. And I'm like, wow, I had good wheels. That could help him too, but if the if the camp was draining 100%. and the fight took it out of him and he didn't recover, well, that's properly. where trainers come in. That's where yeah. smart train. I'm sure he's got smart people around him. You know where where that's a great point you just made. Where the trainers have to not push him to not forget that some of that training is still there. It's still there from from four weeks ago. And they got Burns as a slight favorite, Teddy at minus one twenty five on Burns. You can get plus one ten on uh, Bilal Muhammad. I tell you, it's I, I'm not. Uh, it's hard to bet against Muhammad, and it's hard to yep. bet against Burns. They're, these guys, in some ways, are mirror images of each other. They're they're serious, solid, tough guys. They're very well rounded. They're solid. They are solid, and not a lot of weaknesses, um, if I, I, if any. So, I tell you, it's a coin flip. It's a coin flip. The intangible might be the four weeks. That might be the intangible. Does it help him or hurt him? Uh, Burns is 36 Ma- years old. Yeah. And let Muhammad is... Old. Let me see. Uh, one sec. Oh, Muhammad. Sorry. One second here. You have to click about 100 different things to see this. Uh, get to the bio on ESPN. But he is... Bilal Muhammad is 34 years old. I feel like Gilbert right. Burns, though, when I think about the two of them, I think of Burns as being around a lot longer. So well, yeah, for whatever that's miles. worth, I feel like well, Mah- no, it's Muhammad's worth something. a younger guy. Yeah, more miles on Burns' odometer. Listen, uh, I think that 
tremendously intriguing fight, as I said. Uh, I think Muhammad is probably in as good a place as he's ever been in his career. Uh, tell me if I'm accurate. I believe he's won eight in a row. And now that mental side matters. So that that becomes an important factor here too. I always talk about the mental aspect. He has four, four um, one, two, three, four, eight, eight wins in a row, but in between four, right. four of those yeah, wins, he had a no contest, had the no right? contest with Leon yeah, Edwards, but that was literally yeah. like the beginning of That's the second round. Poke. That was from an eye poke. Yeah. And it was so, a very, very tightly contested fight when it when it was right. going on. He's got eight wins in a row. Last He's time he lost was a unanimous decision, and back in the day, Vincent Luque knocked him out in 2016, yeah, and he this, lost to... Um, Alan Joe Bain, yeah, years. by a decision That's in six seven uh, years in ago. Sixteen. Yep. He he's he's on a winning streak. He's in a good place mentally. I always talk about the mental aspect being seventy five percent in my business in boxing. It's the same, I believe, in MMA. I to all the guys that I've talked to, it's, it's about the same, uh, if not even a little higher, eighty percent. So he's in. He's got that box checked. You would think that he's in a good place mentally, Muhammad, that is. Um, it should be a great match. Let's go back to my bookie now. Start with the Cejudo Sterling. Uh, it's it's almost even on both sides. You get a little bit something if you're taking... Uh, so who do, right? You get no, a, a, minus one fifteen on okay. um Aljo, minus one oh five on um Sohudo. Okay. So you've given up a little less if you take Sohudo. Yep. Um so Sterling a slight favorite. I, I I tell you, I I like them both. I like them both. I might go with Sohudo because until you showed me that this three years is going to diminish him, which it might have. But until I know that for sure, his level of grappling, as I said earlier. Olympic gold medalist. I, well, I said that. Yeah, and no, I know. So, I'm just reiterating. Uh, yeah, so special. So special. So I, I, might, I, might, I might just want to watch this fight, but I might go <laughs> with Cejudo. And then when you go with Burns and Muhammad, I... What is the line on that? Burns, you're giving up a little bit more. Um, one sec, what I say? Minus, uh, minus 125 on, um, on Gilbert. Yeah, minus 125 on Gilbert. Uh, on Muhammad, you're getting back plus 110. All right, it's not, it's not much either way, but I'm, I'm going with Muhammad. I love Burns. I almost hate to say it, but... Yeah. I, I'm going with Muhammad. Partly he's on that win street. They're very similar, solid, solid guys. Burns, I again, I'll reiterate it. I don't know if that four weeks is enough time in between this level of fights in this business. So if I'm forced to, if a gun's put to my head, I'm going with Muhammad and Cejudo. How's that sound? I like it. No, I like it. Um... I can't wait for this. Uh, I can't wait for this card. I love a good UFC, uh, big one of their big pay per view events. The last time we were together was at the um, Poirier Chandler right? fight. Yep, that's right. And uh, yeah, looking forward to it. I think what Charlie means probably they don't have you set up in like one of those boxes. They probably have you in like a cordoned off area overlooking the arena, so there's not necessarily seats in there like they had in the garden up in the suites. So yeah, probably. I get probably. it. But we'll figure, we'll figure something out. out. If you guys, if you're going to be working the uh, main card, maybe right between where the prelims and the main card uh, starts, we can uh, put on Twitter or Instagram where we're going to be hanging near one of the sections. And uh, if some, if anyone wants to come by and say hello, at least we can say hello to people. Yeah, let's see if we can figure that out. That sounds yeah, that sounds nice. And people will get to see the Wizard of Oz, the great Rob Moore, man behind the curtain. Well, if he allows himself to be seen, because he likes that, <laughs> he kind of likes that that He's wizard mysterious. sort of That's thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit out like Al Heyman. Al Heyman <laughs> doesn't let anybody see him. 
You know, That's Rob right. might not let anyone see him. We, and if anyone comes by see. and says Rob is my son, you're getting a punch in the face. So uh, guard your grill. <laughs> <laughs> well, Teddy, that was a good. Uh, that, that was as good a thorough breakdown of the past action and analysis of the upcoming fights as anyone's gonna get. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Everyone have a great week, Teddy. Thanks for doing this, and uh, look forward to seeing you on Saturday night. Uh, look forward. Safe travels, guys. Look forward to being together. All right. Have a have a great week, everyone. Thanks. Happy birthday! <laughs> thanks.